Hello everyone and warm welcome to this special edition of Your Energy Frontiers. During the Finding Petroleum webinar, which was held on June 24, the Executive Chairman of the African Energy Chamber, NJIU, talked about what Namibia needs to do to maximize recent oil and gas discoveries in the Southern African country. This special edition focuses on valuable insights gained from the webinar. Take a listen. Namibia is one of the best hydrocarbon plays. I think we had always been hoping and dreaming for something big to happen in Namibia. And now the country has been very successful. Where do we go from here? That's always a big question. We go, we are the place where you have a government. And the big question you're going to ask is, can Namibia make the same, is Namibia going to make the same mistakes like what we've seen with the other African countries? Is Namibia going to be the next Nigeria or Namibia is going to be the next Angola or Namibia is going to not be able to develop gas or what is, what is that going to happen? We have to look at the fundamental structures. The fundamentals in Namibia are good. What do I mean by that? They have been able to develop a mining system and a regulatory framework that has made it attractive for oil and gas companies to come and explore and develop. They've built a system of checks and balances that already exists within the countries. And it's one of the countries in Africa that has least corruption to them today. Wherever officials have acted improperly, they have been dealt with. And I think that gives me hope of that Namibia can, can, can rise to this occasion. But then we have to also look at, look at issues around policy. How do you fast track these developments? What do you do when uh, uh, during a period where we've seen a big trend around the world dealing with climate change, energy transition, gas flurry, and how are we going to drive that? Yes, what is you, 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 might, you are likely to see. You are going to see the newest technologies in oil and gas exploration and field development being used in Namibia. That's the beauty of coming in last. You look at what you see, what Shell and Total Energies are putting out there. They are very sensitive. You have world-class companies that are very sensitive to issues around the environment, issues around gas flaring, may probably most likely thinking about re-injecting gas and producing more oil. But also, you also have to look at what Namibians are thinking. Namibians are probably are thinking right now of the big advantage of using gas. They've already entered into agreements with um, Zambia on how you're going to build a pipeline and use gas, and that gas could really move into Zambia and take and really power the mines. Namibia is already using a lot of um, coal out of South Africa to power the country. It's a big advantage of using gas to do to, for domestic um, power, power generation, building urea, ammonia, NPK fertilizer plants, really driving a supplier-based economy or pet camps. But there's also that big push where you see green hydrogen being used at this time. They're going to be looking at building energy cities which those energy cities are on all offshore supplier bases are going to be powered by grain. You're going to see grain hydrogen coming into that, and you're also going to see grain ammonia, but also the ability to look at moving gas into places like South Africa to really deal with decarbonization issues when they're looking at facing down coal. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the kind of regulations that they're looking at putting in place. Those regulatory frameworks is really, really important. And the media has done very good when you look at the yeah, petroleum sector with the petrol fund and where they have support from the oil and gas companies to really train people. But that's not enough. A lot more needs to be done. You need to look at a continuing a regulatory framework that makes it more attractive for people to continue ongoing exploration and ongoing investment on people incentivizing local content. We can't look at local content like the same way we look at the past. You've got to look at local content from a, from a viewpoint of empowering people to create market-driven policies that you can reshape the economies and expand the tax base for a lot of people to get jobs, opportunities, and grow. But bigger than that, we got to look at taxes, making sure that we create a tax framework for oil and gas to ensure that production can continue, but also service companies can work. We got to look at 
and have a very firm term and policies around gas flaring and around the um, environmentally sound ways to produce this. I do believe from a chamber perspective that there is big hope and big opportunities to reshape well in an energy sector in Namibia and really close that divide between struggle and success. Does a capacity exist for the Namibian government to change the terms of uh, the licenses? Um, I don't think it's an issue of them changing the terms of the production sharing contracts before development, development plans are being made. Unless we have to be very careful to respect the sanity of contracts. It is supreme, it is key. Namibia has operated on that same principle of respecting the sanity of contracts. And to change it at this moment sends a, it, it would send a bad message to the explorers who are doing ongoing exploration and, and programs. Capital for continuous exploration and development in our region is not stuck just for Namibia or for Botswana or for Ghana. We are competing for capital in the industry that is shrinking upstream hydrocarbon investment. We're competing for that capital with Guyana and Suriname because capital is going to go where it is embraced and wanted and encouraged and nurtured. So we need to send the right message. And those right steps will encourage continuous flow of this investment and then boost up local content and drive up free markets. And then young people are going to know that this is going to work for them. There's a big market in Africa that we have to look at. So not only going to Europe is good, going to Asia is good, but just look right next door to you, South Africa. There is already a big gas market that could be game changer. It helps South Africa to decarbonize from or face down or face out, what, whatever um, um, my leftist friends would, would, would they would choose from, from coal. But now you could, you, could, you, could, you could bring gas to go in, in there. But Namibia itself needs that. Gas to power. Don't use coal. Petrochemicals, urea, ammonia, MPK, fertilizer plants drive new um, um, pet camps industry, supply the world, but also their revenue from here would also help it drive a green economy with, with great potential around green hydrogen because you're not going to get green hydrogen belt in Namibia based on aid. It's too expensive with the electrolyzers. You would have to put some skin in the game. So you would have to find ways that you can use that. But this is also a time to have that conversation with all companies that are talking about they want to spend big on decarbonization and the green economy. So Namibia has a chance to go out there and pick key experts who have maybe worked in Guyana on key field development issues, have looked at driving things in places like Nigeria, maybe have worked in the North Sea, have worked in similar operations, but also looking at technology today when you look around floating LNGs and pick these guys and put a world-class team that drives it together, a very pragmatic common sense approach and drive that. Some of them you're not going to find in Namibia, but also bring Namibians in within that team to develop that. And I think that is going to be essential. And I do have confidence in Namibian leadership to put that team together and help them engage with the IOCs. It's not going to be a conflict. It's not going to be a confrontation. It's going to be a collaboration towards a goal that every, of both sides benefit. Now, one of the issues that we see is that uh, creating local demand, or even regional demand for product, is something that takes some time to develop and requires international investors, Namibian investors working together to uh, great demand for ammonia, urea, fertilizer, uh, local power, and so on. I mean, as we're seeing in Guyana, the 50 million a day that they are going to bring to shore out of the current total gas production, which is some several hundred million a day, is just a start. But even that, Guyana is a small country compared to Namibia. They don't have enough demand even to use up the power from that small amount of gas. So they're going to have to you deploy that into international markets like Brazil and neighbors and so on, which requires international agreements. And that's one of the things that Namibia, I'm sure from what you're saying, is already thinking about with their arrangement with Zambia and probably with, I know that some of the drilling activities were managed from Angola. 
And of course, South Africa is the big, the big boy on the block, so to speak, in terms of its development. So relations with Namibia and those countries are going to be very important to, to keep it constructive. And this is one of the things I think that's held back Guyana a bit, is that they have some issues with Venezuela, maybe with Trinidad and so on. So that is very important as well. Namibia has been a country that's had really great relationship with its neighbors, but also a strong international component when it comes into whether it comes into exporting gas or exporting crude oil. It's also part. And the vision of them seeing that they have a role in global energy stability and security, it's already impressive that this small country sees itself in that role. They have already created fundamental base uh, fundamentals, which the IOCs and foreign experts and others will be able to build upon. It's not going to be an easy job. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be tough. But then you really need to embrace it and drive it faster because also knowing the climate that we in and their big role. Do you make one choice for floating LNG or one choice for a pipeline, or do you try to find a way of doing both? And I, I guess, NJ, you may know this, but um, the plans for Kudu are presumably, uh, I mean, to start producing from now relatively soon. I mean, relative to what we've just been talking about. I think what I know is that the leadership um, there, especially my good friend from Namco, where, um, has been very clear that they made a mistake in not moving on Kudu. And this is also, I think, it, it's, it's, it's like Europe and the Russia problem, where when you get cheap energy out of uh, the other side, you don't really move. So they had a cheap um, uh, energy out of South Africa, and so Kudu was more expensive. But now there is critical mass to really develop Kudu. Kudu is going to be developed in Namibia. They will build upon that. There's a chance that you're going to see floating LNG. They are already moving fast. There is, you've seen appraisals, appraisal worlds that are going to come from both total energies and from Shell, uh, most likely this year. That is a very, very positive step. I mean, and also Namibia, from where it starts, you're going to see a lot of high, so, I mean, at least three or four of the high impact wells in Namibia, I'm sorry, in, uh, um, in, um, three, three, we at the chair, we estimated about nine, nine high impact wells this year. Three or four of them are going to come out, um, out of Namibia. That's huge. So I do think, though, that a lot is going to be seen, given how proactive the companies and the government are moving. But Kudu Gas, I do think, yes, there is a strong willpower to do that. But I think there's going to be, there will have to be some serious conversations between NAM power, which could be a potential off-taker, and really doing that. But look at also what is going on with Recon Africa and their potential to find onshore gas in Namibia. If they have commercially um, quantified onshore gas in Namibia, um, that is also going to be a big game changer. And the government will have to ramp things up and really have some strict, some real gas plans on how to monetize gas and the, the entire bed. It should not be seen as a time to hold back and spend much time on the paralysis of analysis. Uh, what's the best way to go about implementing a balanced and economic development local content policy? Is uh, currently proposing a quite a harsh um, regime and, and reduced foreign participation. Act. It's a big country, and whenever we try to hold back on voices, so what is this political voices from exp from making various proposals on how they're going to do this around local content or balance regional development, then I think that's bad for the industry. But also we have to be very careful not to send a sense of resource nationalism. But, and Namibia is going to have a lot of discussions about that. The politicians, like you know, in every country, they cannot wait to jump on being part of that discussion. But I, but I, I do trust the fundamental principles that they have set up to make this work. And I think that is going to really drive the future. So 
um, Kylie should have a lot of hope. She needs to believe in, in, in where we're going and what the country wants to do. But also it's a good chance to see really smart people like her to really get involved. If Africa fails with Namibia, this sends a very wrong message about the oil and gas industry Africa-wide. We need to make a success story out of it. And everybody watching needs to get involved to make sure that they get it right. They get the support they need. And we encourage what they are doing. And the chicken and the park's a real question, isn't it? Uh, final question. You may not know, but um, again, Mike Cooper asked, you know, if you look at Namibia, I mean, uh, we're in a particular basin at the moment, the Orange Basin, which is, seems to be working. There are a couple of others as you go up the coast towards Angola. It's still in deep water. As far as you know, does Namcar have plans for, for those to get drilled up in the next couple of years? Yes, they do. And this is why when, 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 when we talk about the policies to not to send a sharp wave around the industry with policies that, don't, that do not really embrace continuous exploration, continuous promotion of this, they've waited for a long time. So you have to continue this exploration, but now this is when you really encourage them. I was talking to the authorities there during Africa Energy Week in Cape Town, they are going to lay out a complete plan to really develop and push that area. So there is going to be more exploration. Um, I think Namcor is going to put a lot of pressure around its partners to drill more. We hope Tiny and Exxon can really spot the world next year. That would be really amazing. So we, 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 we hope to see more exploration work happening. They're not stopping. They are going to keep continue moving forward with that. And that is the package for this edition of Your Energy Frontiers. And we thank you for watching. You can follow the show on the Frontier Africa Reports website and across all our social media handles as shown on the screen. It is goodbye from me, Omano Okonkwa, and I will see you next time.